We're turning our attention today to John chapter number 7. We're reading verses 37 to 39. John 7, verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John adds this note, But this he spake, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus offers himself as living water to parched souls. John notes that what Jesus is speaking about is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that would come and eventually did come at Pentecost. This is a regenerating work, a refreshing work a work that brings spiritual life to those who are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus offers himself to satisfy the parched souls of his hearers. The Lagos from John 1, the Word, addresses the basic soul need of humanity. The life of John 1, communicates his readiness to share his life with man. The Lamb of God, John 1, stands in the midst as the satisfactory sacrifice, God's provision to satisfy his own holy demands. The Lord of heaven, John chapter 1, humbled himself to lift the helpless. The light, John chapter 1, penetrates the darkness through the communication of himself. I believe these to be profound theological truths in layman's terms. Deep soul-nurturing food from God. In that very first chapter, as John begins to give us his testimony, his record, his witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, he purposefully uses terms that we can hold on to, that we can constantly reference, that we can come back to when we think about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. To know Christ is to know him as the Lagos. That is the word, translated word in John 1. That communicates Jesus as the self-expression of God. To know God, we must know the Lagos. John uses the word life to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ. He introduces him as the creator of Everything that's physical, nothing exists that he didn't create. And thus, we can understand and connect this with the reality that there is no spiritual life apart from him. Jesus is the Lagos. Jesus is the life. John introduces Jesus as the light. He speaks in terms of Jesus penetrating the darkness. The darkness not overcoming the light. He speaks of Jesus as well as the Lamb of God. This self-expression of God, the Lagos, this life of God, this light that penetrates darkness is also the Lamb of God who pays men's sin debt and satisfies God. He also describes Jesus and speaks of Jesus in the first chapter as Lord, 
He masters the life of the believing. These five words are a reference point that can be constantly brought before us as we seek to bear witness to Jesus Christ. These layman's terms have deep theological significance because they establish for us and remind us what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He is the Lagos. He is the life. He is the light. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lord. These are descriptive terms that John has in his mind as he bears witness to Jesus Christ. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the incarnate Son of Man. He is the full and final exposition of the Father. He is the one through whom we have relationship with God. He is the one who has given us the revelation of God. He is the one who provides reconciliation to God. We've come through another week. We gather on the first day of the week to hear from the Lord again. I'm suggesting to you, I'm suggesting to myself that we think about how John ministered in this gospel. John gives testimony to the witness of Jesus Christ, and by doing so, he bears witness to Jesus Christ, and by doing so, he provides for us what we need to bear witness to Jesus Christ. I believe that when we're sitting with someone who does not know the Lord or we're unsure about their spiritual condition, that if we're thinking in terms of the logos, the word, the self-expression of God, if we're thinking in terms of life, what this person needs is life. If we're thinking in terms of light, Jesus Christ would penetrate that darkness. The gospel would penetrate that darkness. The truth would penetrate that darkness. If we're thinking in terms of the Lamb of God, we're thinking about the sacrifice that is necessary in order to pay the sin debt so that God can grant to us forgiveness and give us His Spirit and give to us eternal life. When we think in terms of Lord and Lordship, we're thinking about His governing of our lives and how in giving the gospel record, in giving gospel witness and great commission living, we are communicating that believers are commanded, are expected to do all that he has commanded, to make disciples, is to bring people into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where they live in obedience to him. I would like to think today with you from John chapter 7 about bearing witness to Jesus Christ what we might call Great Commission Living. I want to suggest to you that this is essentially what John is doing in his gospel record. He's bearing witness to Jesus Christ. John's heart was saturated with the truth about Jesus Christ, and his passion was the outflowing in testimony to Jesus Christ. Bearing witness to Jesus Christ, John said that others might see and might believe. Our theme and our thinking together today is this. The witness of John is a timeless testimony to the ministry of Christ in every age. To behold the ministry of Jesus Christ from a first-hand witness is to recognize that what he is doing at the end of that first century is being that testimony. Christ is giving testimony through John, and by extension, to move that even further forward to 2020, where we live, Christ bears witness through us. The witness of John is a timeless testimony to the ministry of Christ in every age. This is how we minister the gospel. This is a testimony in John 7 as to how we might expect hearers to respond. It helps us to 
understand what needs to be communicated. It gives us insight into where people are in their thinking. It guides us in engaging the culture with the gospel. It instructs us in living out grace as we communicate grace. We as God's people are to have intentional interest in the souls of others. This is the ministry of Jesus. This is the ministry of the apostles. An intentional interest in the souls of others. Wherever we are at whatever time, there should be an intentional interest in the souls of others. There should as well be a sincere inquiry into the spiritual condition of others. We should be looking for opportunities to inquire into the spiritual condition of others. The Lord has left us here for this. Intentional interest in the souls of others. Sincere inquiry into the spiritual condition of others. But there should also be a spirit-sensitive witness as our pattern of life. We're talking about the joy and the satisfaction of being involved in that which is eternal. May I turn your attention, please, to John chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse number 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. John tells us in that first verse that the setting is one of hostility toward Jesus Christ. We have been reminded in recent weeks that this begins the final six months of the ministry of Jesus Christ as he's back in Judea. There's been a negative reaction. There is a negative reaction toward Jesus' earlier ministry. He had healed on the Sabbath, and then he had communicated himself as God, as coming from God, as working for God, as speaking for God. And so there was a determined intent to eliminate the Lagos. We don't want the self-expression of God. To eliminate the life. We don't need the life of God. To eliminate the light. We don't like the condemnation that comes with that light penetrating the darkness. We want to eliminate the Lamb of God. He's here to take away the sins of the world. We want him eliminated. We want to eliminate the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus is walking in Galilee, not desiring to walk in Judea, because the Jews, in this case the official leadership, is seeking to kill him. This sets up what follows in the story. We see that the life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility. It did the same in the days of the apostles in the early church. It will do so in our day as well. The life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility. Jesus was not hostile, but his claims caused hostility. Jesus was good. Jesus was gracious. Jesus was gospel speaking. But his hearers chafed at his words. They chafed at his actions. In John chapter 2, as he cleanses the temple and challenges the religion of his day, he is speaking for the Father, he has a passion for the Father, and that stirred up hostility. Later, as he claims deity and saviorhood and ultimate kingship, that stirs up hostility. So the issue at hand today, as in that day, is who is Jesus Christ? Why did he come? And am I believing in him? As Jesus says to those apostles at the end of John's gospel, so send I you as the Father has sent me, so send I you. The success of the church of Jesus Christ in our day has been more defined by being accepted and by blending in and by being attractive Hostility is something that is not in the mind of many believers, maybe most believers. We've forgotten that the life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility. 
Verse number 2 of John 7, Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Jesus always celebrated the feast as prescribed in the law. He fulfilled the law of God. Here we see that the favorite feast, the most well-attended feast of the year, is being celebrated. It's a feast that looks back at Jewish history. It's a feast that looks forward at Jewish prophecy. It's a celebration of the past. It's a celebration of the present and the future works of God. It's the most joyous celebration of the year. It's a celebration, as we have noted, that involves light. They carried lights with them. It involves water. They took water from the pool of Siloam and poured it out in ceremony. They quoted Psalm 113 to 118. It's a testimony of life, and this makes that makes clear why it is that Jesus stands and presents himself, passionately cries out that he is the water of life and invites men to embrace him. It's a celebration of history. It's a celebration of hope. Verse number three, we continue his brethren as his physical brothers. Therefore said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And John explains, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Verse 5. The crowd is gone. The most profound, the broadest of Jesus' miracles had just taken place with the feeding of the 5,000. A most penetrating message had been given as he presents himself as the bread of life, and the crowd left. His brothers are with him still, and his disciples are with him still. And there's an uncertainty. There has not been an expression of faith and hope in his physical brothers. And they said to him, this would be a good time to establish your kingship. Things are not going well. Everybody has left. Now, there's a feast up in Jerusalem. Let's go up. And they're thinking about going up with the caravan. They're thinking about going up in the midst of the people. Jesus knew that this actually was the beginning of his course toward the cross. And so what has happened here and what is happening before us is there are two opposite perspectives. And, and John is watching this and his brothers are saying this and Jesus is responding this way. And Jesus has one ultimate purpose in mind. And this sets up the record that John gives us in chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, because all of this is in this setting. Jesus is thinking in spiritual terms, and his brothers are thinking in material, physical terms. And that comes up again and again in chapter 7, just like it did in chapter 6. We're continuing now in verse number 6. John 7 and verse number 6. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. He's speaking here of, Kronos. He's speaking about a timetable. He's not speaking specifically about his hour, as he does in other places, thinking about the passion of the cross. But it's not time for me to go up. Uh, but your time is always ready. You can go on up. Verse number seven explains that the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Here's why. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. My presence here my works and my words are a testimony that men need a savior, that men are evil, that men need to be dealt with spiritually. So he tells them, you go up, verse number eight, you go up into the feast. I will not, I go up, I go not up yet into this feast for my time is not full come. It's not time for me to go up. When he had said these words, Unto them he abode still in Galilee. So he stayed behind as the disciples went up with the caravan. The life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility. G. Campbell Morgan makes this point, and I share it with you this morning. Jesus was the one calm, poised, majestic soul. In the midst of all the calamity and all the 
challenges and all the hostility which was just introduced, Jesus is calm and poised, truly majestic. His family and his friends are perplexed. They're not hostile, but they're unclear. They're unsure. After three years of ministry, they're perplexed. The Galileans and the Judeans are confused as a whole. Jesus has ministered for two years in Galilee, and still when all these pilgrims come up out of Galilee, there's confusion. We're going to see it in this chapter. The conservatives, now that would be the Pharisees, and the liberals, now that would be the Sadducees uh, that make up the Sanhedrin. They're hostile. The recent ministry and claims of Jesus Christ has caused them to be hostile, to want to get rid of him. They hated him. Why did they hate him? Jesus answers that. They hate him because he exposes their sin. Jesus, on the other hand, is settled. I'll stay here. I'll come up later. Because he knows why he came. He knows where he's headed. The life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility, but... He was the one calm and poised and majestic soul. He was also the only one that's fully aware of his saving agenda. He knew who was in control. He had his eye toward the Father. He understood why he had come. See, Jesus expected the rejection. Jesus anticipated the rejection that he was experiencing. Jesus knew of the hostility, but he also knew that nothing would happen on man's timetable. Nothing would happen because the people were stirred up. Everything that was going to take place was part of the eternal counsel of God. And he trusted his father. There was controversy. There was confusion. There was a lot of chatter. There were a lot of conclusions. You see, Jesus understood that to be the context of gospel witness, to be the atmosphere of testifying of Christ, and to bring that forward to John's day at the end of the first century, to bring that forward to our day in the 21st century, is to remember that confusion and controversy and chatter and various conclusions is not intended to silence the gospel. It is the atmosphere of the gospel. That is the atmosphere into which needs to be introduced hope, good news, life in Jesus Christ, life after this life, something that is eternal. The citizens of Jerusalem and the rulers and the Jews from outside Jerusalem, the pilgrims, were not aware as Jesus was of his saving agenda. The life and ministry of Christ stirs up hostility but he was the one that was calm and poised and majestic. He was the one that was fully aware of his saving agenda. What about us? What about our mission field? Well, our mission field is marked, first of all, by ignorance. People don't know. People don't know. In a post-Christian culture, the majority of people have no clue who Jesus Christ is or who Jesus Christ claimed to be. Our mission field is one of ignorance. People need to hear. Our mission field is one of confusions, pluralistic. And that's a word that describes what I heard on several occasions this week in conversation with others. And that is different people have different ideas about how to get to heaven. Different religious systems have different ideas, and, and we need to give people room to believe whatever they want to believe, which basically puts man in the place of deciding what is truth, and there's confusion. Our mission field is thirdly characterized by hostility. This is the context of Jesus' ministry. This is the context of John's ministry. John's day was not a day. Where Christ was being embraced, John actually was exiled because of his testimony for Christ. Ignorance, confusion, hostility. But what about our manner? What about the way we carry ourselves? What about the way that we live and minister in this day? Is there for us a testimony from John and a testimony from Jesus? First of all, 
convinced. We must be convinced. Genuine believers, sincere believers are convinced. They've been convinced, convicted about the truth of God's word. It's not a, a gospel that we apologetically suggest. It's a gospel that is to be proclaimed as truth. As we were told in John 7, Jesus once again is speaking with authenticity. He's speaking with authority. He's not brash, but he speaks convinced, settled. We must be those that are settled, which means the we're settled in our disposition. We're settled in our hope. We're not being tossed to and fro with each cycle of the news. We're not moving from thing to thing. We're not grasping after some way to root down in a tempestuous culture. We're settled. Our manner is also to be one of sensitivity. Is this not what we see in John's message? Is this not what we see in Jesus' ministry? Convinced he spoke with authority and authenticity. Settled. He's unrattled. He knows exactly what's on the horizon. He knows what these next six months hold. But he's also sensitive. Every time Jesus speaks to these confused, ignorant, hostile people, he's calling them to saving grace. He's ministering the gospel in order to bring souls to himself. Let's continue reading in verse number 10. This is John 7 and verse 10. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but in secret. So he didn't go up with the caravan of pilgrims that moved into Jerusalem. He went up later. Well, then verse number 11 says the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? They expected him to be there because he attended the Jewish feast and also because what he did on that hillside and what he said on that hillside to many thousands of people was still fresh on their mind. He was the topic of discussion. Where's Jesus? Where's that one that's claiming Messiahship? Verse number 12 says there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. They're talking among themselves quietly. For some said he was or is a good man. Others said nay, but he deceiveth the people. How be it? Verse number 13, John wants us to understand no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. So as John bears firsthand testimony to what happened in that day, he lets us know that the works and words of Christ had awakened consideration. Some said he was a good man. Some said he was a deceiver. Some had embraced his claim to be the Lamb of God. Others understood him to be a blasphemer. Some were considering his claims of messiahship. Others were declaring that he was an imposter. There was pressure from without in verse number 13. 13, it says they're talking about these, these things among themselves, but nobody's willing to speak openly. There's no plainness of speech going on because of the outside pressure. We learn from this that exposure to Christ forces a conclusion about Christ. His works and his words forced a conclusion. What he was doing authenticated who he was. What he said came forward with authority. It was clear that he was the light of the world and he was present in a dark world and he was penetrating that darkness and people were being stirred up by that. It was clear that he was the life of God, that he confronting the spiritual death of rebels as well as religionists. It was clear that he was the Lamb of God who spoke as the I Am. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. Exposure to Christ forces a conclusion about Christ. Secondly, pressures, verse 13, pressures concerning Christ hamper honest consideration. 
public opinion dominates. Shining the light in a dark world is to recognize that public opinion dominates. Satan has systematically broken down the idea of one creator God to whom all are accountable. Human rebellion will not tolerate the idea of a personal lordship of Jesus Christ being Lord. It will protect its own lordship, its own anarchy, its own self-government. The cultural conclusions, the majority perspective hampers honest consideration. As we go out with the gospel, as we share the gospel, this is the case for us as well. Verse 14 says, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So he takes his place as a rabbi. He sits down there in the temple area. Now he begins to teach, and it says in verse 15, the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? They recognized that he had not been trained in the official schools. He had not and was not communicating this system of religion that they were used to. That was the majority belief of the day. Jesus answers their inquiry. And he says in verse 16, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. And then he adds, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What is Jesus doing? I believe Jesus is calling for an honest consideration of what he's saying. But pressures concerning Christ hampered that honest consideration. We might add this, the truth about Christ. And this is what Jesus says. The truth about Christ originates with the Father and it comes in power. How does he have such authority? We've not heard anyone speak like this. This will come up later in the chapter. There's a convicting work going on by the Holy Spirit. There's a challenge to the way that people are thinking. Some are being convinced. There's an internal work taking place at the soul level that's really answering man's thirst. This issue of confusion and unbelief this refusing of the truth is coming to the surface and becoming clear. Verse number 18, Jesus goes on and explains, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. The inconsistency of inconsistencies of their reasoning is confronted by the Lord. I'm not speaking of myself. I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm speaking for God, the one who sent me. Verse number 19 goes right to the issue that's causing the resentment, and the rejection, and the hostility. He says, did, verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Well, the people, that would be the multitude at large, the crowd answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. People from Galilee, people from the surrounding areas, the pilgrims that came up to Jerusalem, they didn't realize that the authorities were seeking to kill him. The people inside of Jerusalem, at least some of them knew this. Well, Jesus answers in verse 21 and said unto them, I have done one work and ye all marvel. So he reaches back to the healing of the man on the Sabbath day in chapter 5. And he adds, Moses, verse 22, therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision, which was a minor surgery, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole, completely well on the Sabbath day? His conclusion, verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. He takes aim at their religious assumptions their personal bias, 
their earthbound perspectives. You're looking at the outside. Jesus is saying to them, who truly are the lawbreakers? Who truly is condemned? Who truly is the judge? He calls them to honest evaluation, honest consideration. Exposure to Christ forces a conclusion about Christ. Thus we declare, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pressures concerning Christ hamper honest consideration. Thus we understand there's intense energy against Christ. There's a cultural perspective. There's a majority view that is against Christ. The truth about Christ originates with the Father and comes in power. And thus we go out convinced, certain, as we communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. John does that in the end of the first century. Jesus does that in his day. We do this in our day, despite the hostility expecting the hostility. Let's think now in terms of our message. Well, as we've listened, listened to John's record of Jesus, as we think about his ministry and our ministry, let's use this word. Our message is authentic. What does that mean? It means that people will consider and will think and will listen. The Spirit of God will bear witness to them that this message is from the Father. This message is from the one who is the offended one, the one that they are at enmity with. This is authentic truth. This is the only way to God. God has made that way through himself, this Lagos. God is communicating life. God, through Christ, is, is shining forth light that dispels the darkness. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lord of eternity. Our message is authentic. Secondly, it's trustworthy. Let your soul be encouraged today. It's trustworthy. It promises life and it brings life. If you're a believer today, it has brought life to you. Someone gave you the gospel. Faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's authentic. It's trustworthy. And thirdly, it is alive. It is life-giving. It's sourced in God. To not be ashamed of the gospel includes not being embarrassed by it, but it also includes the fact that the gospel will not disappoint. It will not let us down. Paul makes that declaration. It's alive. It's trustworthy. It's authentic. It promises. It supplies life. That's our message. What about our mode? What do we do with this gospel? Simply proclaim it. Our mode is proclamation. We're called to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. And every week, like this week, as we prepare ourselves, as we worship the Lord, as we anticipate the coming days, we have a responsibility and a privilege to proclaim Christ. Our mode is also that of explanation. We need to have conversation. We need to listen to what's going on in men's souls, and we need to be ready to respond. We need to be ready not to argue necessarily, but to turn their hearts to be the undoing of the, com the confusion. We watch Jesus doing that in his ministry. There's explanation. There's also anticipation. The reason we proclaim the gospel and proclaim Christ is there's an anticipation that that truth, the sowing of that seed, the watering of that seed will bring forth fruit. There's also the anticipation and the recognition that many who hear will say no. There's the recognition that they have external pressures. They've been influenced by majority opinion. They're earthbound, just like the people in Jesus' day, and they can't hear anything that doesn't apply to right here, right now for them. So our mode is one of proclamation, explanation, and anticipation. In doing this, we are reflecting the ministry of John and the ministry of Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 25, 
Then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? Now, John makes it clear as he's looking in on this situation. Now, now he's talking about people that are from Jerusalem proper. These are people who know what's going on among the leadership. And so uh, they're not saying, oh, he has a devil who's going about to kill you. They're saying, isn't this one that's speaking freely, the one whom they're seeking to kill? Verse number 26, but lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? They say, have they come to the conclusion that this is the Messiah? How be it? They immediately answer their question. How be it? We know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Well, that's a misunderstanding of Isaiah's statement, who shall declare his generation? This is a misunderstanding based upon how they have been taught. So they're looking in, they're watching. There's a ring of authenticity and authority. There's an irresistible nature Ir irresistible uh, uh, force to what Jesus is saying. And then there's this counter resistance of religious bias. These are all barriers to the gospel. How did Jesus respond as he knew this was taking place? Well, note in verse number 28, it says, then cried Jesus. Now that speaks of emotion and volume. That speaks of passion and conviction. This is Jesus speaking for God as God. And John remembers that. He says at this point, Jesus cried in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. He repeats his claims with clarity. I'm not a self-appointed self-approving Messiah. I'm here because I was sent here, and you do know me, and you do know where I came from. I know him, he says in verse 29, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Well, verse 30 says, then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Jesus speaks with power. He says, you know me, true, I know him, true, you don't know him, and only through me can you know him. What a claim, what a claim, you know me, I know him, you don't know him, and only through me can you know him? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, we see the protective hand of his father in verse 30. His hour was not yet come. Verse 31 says, Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? As the resistance increases, there are others who are looking in and saying, he's doing everything God promised the Christ would do. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and chief priests sent officers to take him. So the temple police are sent along the way, and they're supposed to go arrest Jesus. Jesus continues to minister, verse number 33. Then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while, Am I with you? And then I go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. He gives them further truth. Now he's talking about returning to glory by way of the cross and resurrection and ascension. Verse 35, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go? That we shall not find him. Again, they're bound to earthy material thinking. Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, you shall seek me and shall not find me and where I am thither ye cannot come. What is he talking about? What is he referring to? Verse 37 talk, takes us to the last day, the seventh day of the feast, that grand day. And verse 37 says, in the last day, 
A lot of ceremony going on here, walking about with these lights, remembering the leading through the wilderness and the care through the wilderness, but also the anticipation of becoming Messiah. Well, in the last day, that great day of the feast, verse 37 says, Jesus stood and cried again, emotion, volume, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John adds this side note, this he spake of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So he anticipates that future day. But on this day, Jesus calls thirsty souls to come and drink. He says, if anyone is thirsty, if you are recognizing that you're desperately parched spiritually, your soul is parched. This water materially is absolutely necessary for life. Now, Jesus calls himself that water absolutely necessary for spiritual life. We are created to flow with the life of God and spiritual death has taken that away. And Jesus Christ grants spiritual life. Everything that is anticipated, everything that has been prophesied is present in Christ. And he says that I am the spiritual life flow. I'm the bread of life. I am the living water. He's bringing them face to face with the reality of his promised messianic work. He's addressing the spiritual soul thirst, and this is our witness. This is our proclamation. Verse 40 says, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Again, the passion, the ministry, the authenticity, the authority with which Jesus speaks is impressing the people. Others said, verse number 41, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? More confusion. Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? And that's where Jesus came from out of Bethlehem. But there's again, there's confusion. So there was a division among the people because of him. Verse 44 says some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. There's a mixed response of ignorance and confusion and hostility. That's true in the apostles day. That's true in our day. Ignorance, confusion, hostility. Well, then came verse number 45. You remember they, these temple police were sent. Well, then came the officers of the temple police to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, that is the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and Pharisees said to the temple police, those officers, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered verse 46, never man spake like this man. Their answer was, the authority with which he speaks, the authenticity through which he works, then answered them, the Pharisees. The Pharisees said to the temple police, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law or curse, now note this, this transition in verse number 50 answers the question, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him. It says, Nicodemus, verse 50, saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and knoweth what he doeth? So Nicodemus speaks up. They answered and said unto him, art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Verse number 53 says, every man went and to his own house. The temple police and the national authorities were scheming. The plan is in motion to eliminate Christ and Nicodemus steps forward to speak up for Christ. Let's think about our motivation. Our motivation, what do we see in the life and ministry of Christ? What do we see in the life and ministry of John? What do we see in our lives? Well, I think we see first of all, a motivation of truth, the truth about Jesus. It burns in the souls of believing people. It's a truth that we desire 
others to know. It's a truth that has set us free. But then there's devotion. There's devotion. There's this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There's this relationship of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our souls, drawing us, moving us. We worship Him. We pray to Him. We learn of Him. Our motivation is truth. We have the truth. Our motivation is devotion. We are devoted to Christ. We are devoted to Great Commission living. We are devoted to God's kingdom purposes. And thirdly, compassion. The truth about Jesus Christ from God. Commitment to Jesus Christ in a living relationship. And then participation with others in sharing Christ. What do we have before us in John 7? We have the gospel ministry of Jesus. But we also have the gospel ministry of John as he records the gospel ministry of Jesus. We also have the gospel ministry of the church in 2020. They're parallel. Christ was at work in his day and in the apostles' day and in our day. The days of ignorance and confusion and hostility. These are the days for the communication of the gospel for the communication of the goodness of God, for the communication of the gospel of grace, for the communication of the person of Jesus Christ as the I am of salvation, the author of eternal life, the singular hope of humanity. What shall we do with our challenge for today? I would just encourage us all, first of all, to be honest with the question, am I a child of God. Is there evidence of spiritual life in my soul? Secondly, I would encourage believers to be involved in the cultivation and the nurturing of that which is spiritual and eternal. Young parents, I would encourage you to do this in your home. Young adults, I would encourage you to do this in your relationship with God and relationship with others. Cultivate and nurture that which is spiritual and that which is eternal. And I would encourage us as well to be involved in kingdom work. To look upon men as Jesus looked upon men. To look upon men as John, the apostle, is looking upon men. To recognize the reality of the hostility, but to move into that hostility with compassion and concern and genuine interest in eternal souls. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the record. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this privilege and opportunity to think through these things together. Now, may it be true of us that our lives are marked by Great Commission living. Our lives are marked by a devotion to Jesus Christ that is evident. We praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen.